The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. They may be drinkers, Robin, but they're also human beings. Hell yeah, let's get Stinko. This is the Giles and the Goalie Podcast as part of the Zone Coverage Podcast Network. With your hosts, Giles Farrell and Ben Remington. Welcome, Giles and the Goalie Podcast. I am your host, Giles Farrell. That uh, rocking out across the table is Ben Remington. Hello. Uh, trade deadline day was uh, we recorded just after a couple hours after the trade deadline, uh, and boy, what a what a roller coaster day! <laughs> <laughs> we finally had the foresight. Well, I mean, we've done it before, where it's like, yeah, let's not record until after the trade deadline because. We've done so many shows, not around the deadline necessarily, but so many shows where we record, and, and literally within minutes, something big happens, and so we, like a couple years ago, we finally got smart, and we were like, let's wait till after the deadline, and today, that didn't do us a bit of good. I mean, I guess we can talk about it, but... Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, we can get into it, and you know, we don't need to fill your, your ears with useless crap right off the hop, but... Um, yeah, today the Minnesota Wild were oh so close to making a huge, huge uh, trade huge. that uh, really even had the TSN insiders uh, kind of floored. There was a <laughs> audible gasp in the in the the TSN studio, but uh, Zach Parisi was oh so close to being traded to the New York Islanders. Uh, trade details not not really out there. We only know that possibly. Andrew Ladd was coming back in the deal, uh, but the trade uh, fell apart in the uh, waiting moments prior to the 2 p.m. Central Time uh, deadline on Monday, and yeah, the Wild otherwise did nothing on Monday uh, before the deadline, so their roster stays uh, pretty much intact, uh, you know, outside of the Jason Zucker trade of a couple weeks ago, uh, but... Yeah, Zach Parisi almost traded. They had gotten to the point where no movement clauses had been waived, uh, which you know typically means the deal is close. So it's it's kind of the running belief that uh, just the money part of it couldn't be worked out in time, which you know it it, it I, yeah. I get I guess, but I, I don't I don't know it. I'm not a capologist, so. <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, we don't know what the parameters of the deal were, but if you look at it straight up, uh, Ladd has three years left on his deal at roughly $4.5 million cap hit, uh, where Parisi has five years left with a $7.5 million, obviously. So um, I, I guess it begs the question, and, and we don't know, ex- again, exactly what kind of money was being talked about because you can always retain salary in, in the NHL. Um, <clears throat> do you give away Zach Parisi to save $3 million a year for the next three years and then seven point five for the two years after that, assuming, again, that there's not a cap or capture penalty um, in those final years, which there very well could be? Um, but <clears throat> is that worth it to you? I don't know. It seems to me... Like, that wasn't going to be a very good trade for the Wild, even though, I mean, getting rid of Preezy's contract is exciting in a way, again, because, you know, you would have gotten two years shorter and less money, but only $3 million a year. And, and again, again, maybe there was some retained money on the Islanders' part getting rid of Ladd because he's certainly completely worthless as opposed to Preezy, who's still a fairly good and productive player. I don't know, $3 million a year for three years. That's all you're saving. Yeah, I, I I am searching for some answers on that, but I, I I wonder if this has more to do with maybe what we talked about last week in that, you know, maybe this is kind of a needed core shakeup of Bill Guerin maybe wanting to move on from players who maybe don't necessarily want to be here anymore. 
<laughs> I, you know, Zach Parise's not been a stranger to making it known that he is not really on board with the direction this team has gone in the last. I can't really blame him. You know, year and a half. Uh, two general managers uh, missed playoffs last year. On pace to miss it again this year. Um, and I, I just think. Truly, it was just going to be a cap savings kind of a deal, but you can't really buy out the Andrew Ladd contract because it's loaded with signing bonuses, right? which is really buyout and lockout uh, proof. Yeah. Yeah. So, and again, it's hard to fully judge what could have been because we don't know the full details of the trade. You know, had right. This, this may come out over time, but, you know, today... You know, you're not getting much out of Lou Lamorello. <laughs> you never really get much out of him. And let me tell you this. What an archaic way to run your organization when as soon as it somehow leaks out that you're possibly working on a trade, then you just shut it down, which, you know. Some How likely do you think that is? I, I think that's a very good chance. Really? Because it was... Because you know, it, it was, was leaked at about 11 a.m.? And then shortly after, you saw some people wonder, like, is this going to fall through now because it's been leaked and yeah. Lou has a history of backing away from deals after they leak. I, <clears throat> From his standpoint, that's an awfully foolish way to operate around the trade deadline, right? Because so many teams, I mean, and I get it, you know, you can tell the GM across the aisle not to tell anybody, but it. He can't be the only person that knows on the other side of the trade. You know, certainly other people in the front office have to do their due diligence. So you're looking at a minimum of like, what, five to ten people at least, at the very least, right. that know about this trade on the wild side. And you're you're <clears throat> expecting them to not tell a single soul in the media to the point where you will kill a trade that helps your team if... One of these five to ten people tell... I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. And again, he's hurting his team. Zach Preezy is a hell of a lot more useful to the Islanders than Andrew Ladd is. So Andrew Ladd, who's been <clears throat> buried in the minors for Ex- exactly. all of, You know, all except two games this year. Exactly. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It just... There's a lot of confusion, and we don't have a lot of clarity... And certainly with the general managers involved, we're probably not going to get much clarity <laughs> for a while. And, True. you know, we may get this over time from somebody like Russo who will kind of leak it in on pieces, you know, if you follow him closely enough. He seemingly was at the, the ready to hit the send button on a, on a post saying the trade was done. So at... You know, it just never got across the finish line, and it'll always kind of be a what if. And I, I see a lot of disappointment out there among the uh, Minnesota Wild faithful. And <laughs> I, for a trade that you didn't really think was going to happen before today, you know, everybody sure got worked up over nothing. And right. this was kind of the the crux of my post deadline piece on zone coverage was the Parisi contract along with the Suter contract was pretty much thought to be an unmovable thing and Bill Guerin was you know on the goal line of sending that mm-hmm. trade through mm-hmm. and I spent more of the day shocked that it was that close mm-hmm because sure. y- you heard, yeah, teams were interested in Zach Parisi, but you never heard of a, you know, a deal being in place or players moving no movement clauses. And I truly thought that the Wild were going to have to ride out the remainder of their contracts, uh, whether you know that means you know they uh, play for the next five years or they get put on LTIR for some part of that, but <laughs> I was pretty much resigned to the fact that those contracts were not ever going to be moved off of the Minnesota Wild books. And Same. there's seemingly some kind of light at the end of the tunnel that <laughs> one of those deals might get moved, especially Parisi, who he really wants to win. And you might see him go in the offseason season 
to maybe somebody who can win. But again, the Wild are going to have to take on some kind of terrible contract. They're not going yeah. to trade Parisi and get some kind of decent return that you're all going to like. They're going to have to take a bad contract back, similar to what Andrew Ladd's deal was. Right. And maybe this is a, you know, a, a structure of a trade that gets revisited in the summer, the Wild and the Islanders, because Zach Parisi has previous ties to Lou Lamarillo from mm-hmm. their days in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And certainly the Islanders are uh, a team that's built to win and, as you uh, so uh, eloquently. Joke, yeah, eloquently pointed out on Twitter, <laughs> watch the Islanders go on and win the Stanley Cup this year. <laughs> I doubt that, but yeah, that was a joke. People don't. don't that would be don't at me. That would be uh, some kind of weird irony, but <clears throat> and maybe the other thing we're not. Uh, well, I think plenty of people see that, but I, I think in the the Parisi excitement was the fact that. It kind of feels like the Wild zeroed in altogether on the Parisi trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, again, we don't really know what was going on, so this is just pure conjecture. We're not insiders of any... Insider. Yeah, really, really roll your R there. But I, I'm sure there were calls about Dumba and Brodine and Foligno. Oh, yeah. I, I just... I don't know. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, man, words are tough. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, were the Wild too zeroed in on the Parisi deal and that they maybe lost sight of working out some other kind of deal, you know, involving some other kind of tradable assets that they had because it really was a seller's market. Mm-hmm. And I mean,. I don't even remember that guy's name, but some at the very end of the deadline. Oh, uh, so, Barclay Goodrow. Yeah, Barclay Goodrow netted a first <laughs> round pick. Imagine the Kings Granted ransom. Granted, they sent a third with him, so it was moving up from the third to the first. But still, still a fair Imagine point. Imagine the point. Kings ransom you could have gotten for a guy like oh Marcus Foligno. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I was going to say the, the one comment I have on Parisi. Um, my God, is this going to dump gasoline on the fire for all the rubes that want Preezy to waive his no-trade clause? The fact that he allegedly did it already today and the trade didn't happen um, is just, I mean, this is diesel fuel on a bonfire. Like, this is just absolutely the worst possible thing for those guys who think that the Wild will win the Stanley Cup if only they could just get back Preezy off the books. Um <clears throat> that, so yeah, it's no, definitely a negative. In, it's definitely a negative in that light uh, for those of us who don't want to put up with that kind of crap. Um, so yeah, I, I, but yeah, to your point, I, I think that the Parisi deal did take up a lot of Bill Guerin's time today. Uh, I, at least I hope that's the reason. And he said at the conference he didn't want to make a deal for the sake of making a deal. And and I am totally with that. I don't want that either. And I wrote that last week, but. But you you mean to tell me you got no good offers for Marcus Foligno? You got nothing for him? Mm, he's like that that you seriously you got no offers for Marcus Foligno. He's untouchable. You there there's a first rounder out there being thrown around for for Barclay Goodrow and you got no passable offers for Marcus Foligno. With a year left on his contract and you know one of the better defensive forwards underrated defensive forwards in the league. A team's not going to want that for the playoffs. Not to mention he's huge, and he's gritty. I mean, I mean, he's he he's like an analytics and uh, old school wet dream. I uh, just <laughs> I don't understand every. T- he should appeal to every team. And I'm sure he did. But and again. it just untouchable. Are you are you nuts? What what is he is he going to bring that much value to this team? So here's my. I am being objective here. Marcus Foligno, yes, good player, and he has exceeded you know any kind of expectation that I've had for him since he was acquired a few years ago. The problem is he is getting close to thirty, and you know these guys who play like he does have a shelf life, and once they go downhill, 
it is a very sharp decline. Yeah. So if you don't cash in while while you can, you, you're going to get nothing. And I, I also don't think the Wild are going to be relevant enough, you know, before Felino declines. Yeah. The only reason you could say he's worth hanging on to is if you think he could win and he can be that great depth guy in the bottom of the lineup who can give you that spark. I don't think the Wild are going to be in a position while he's still going to be good to justify keeping him around. Right. And that's that's the issue that I have is there just seems to be a little bit of delusion as to where this team is going to be in the next, at least in the next year. Apparently they're still delusional on the fact that they're going to make the playoffs this year. Spoiler, <laughs> they're not. They're five points out of a wild card spot right now. Mm-hmm. And as I pointed out, it's going to take a, a miracle run to uh, jump these four teams. They have to get over just to get into a playoff spot. They have to get good go- goaltending. They haven't gotten that all year. No, no, it's not going to change anytime soon. It's not going to change anytime soon. This isn't just related to this year. This was a last year thing, too. Right. If you're still delusional about that, wake up and smell the you-know-what. <laughs> not Shinola. Um <coughs> Yeah, and, and if the game on Sunday night, if the savage ass kicking they received from the Blues on Sunday night wasn't, uh, you know, a red flag enough for some folks, or should have been a white flag, really, uh, I mean that 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 was a, should have been kind of a, a little bit of a punctuation on, on the, <coughs> you know, the the pre trade deadline part of the season, where it's like they are not going to make the playoffs, period, period. That game was the period on that sentence. And uh, I, I just don't know, you know, we don't know what happened, obviously. And, and it's very easy to criticize the Wild for not making any moves, and that's kind of what we're doing. <clears throat> not knowing what actually went down and not knowing what offers they got. But I just, I find it a little hard to believe they didn't get any worthwhile offers for Flino. Um, <laughs> we saw a rumor that they were getting calls on Greg Paterin. <laughs> Which is just the side of hilarious, because uh, if they got one call on Greg Panarin, why isn't he? Or sorry, Paterin, uh, why isn't he gone? Why isn't he gone? Why isn't Greg Paterin off the team if you got a phone call on him? Yeah, something something didn't add up with that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, just silliness. I don't know what what's going on, but the <sighs> things people will tweet from verified accounts. Uh, just I don't know, and so. I, I guess that it, it it's easy to criticize not knowing what happened in the room, but uh, it also feels like, to your point, that Garen kind of drug his feet today. Like he kind of you know waited for a deal that absolutely blew his blew his socks off, and he was never going to get that. But he would have gotten a good deal for Felino, and he would have got or he could have gotten a good deal for Brodine if he just had worked at it. That, that's kind of my feeling on the whole situation. Uh, the other big trade chips that the wild had as we mentioned already matt dumba jonas brodeen Mm -hmm. uh, and to a lesser extent uh eric stahl even Mm. uh not not moved as well uh today and even to a lesser lesser extent greg patteron who may or may not have gotten a phone call (laughs) at the, the wild front office but so now that we've seen the wild stand pat before the trade deadline outside of the the Zucker trade we mentioned a couple weeks ago, what are we to expect from them moving forward? Absolutely nothing. Batman forever. Absolutely nothing. Like th- this and and not to say that them selling at the deadline would have given anybody any reason to watch either. But at least had they clear, and, and this still could happen, at least had they cleared out some folks. You know, Jerry Mayhew is up right now, technically. Um, we'll see if he gets any playing time tomorrow night. I slotted in at practice today on I the first line. I saw that. So <clears throat> he's like the only reason to watch this team right now. Him and Kevin Fiala. Because it's like... You know, that and obviously the Kirill watch as soon as the KHL season is over. That's it. But 
Kirill watch doesn't take place until far after the wild season has ended. I mean, well, we're right. talking weeks. Well, but, I mean, but if the KHL season is over, he can, it's not like he's going to join the team this year. I'm not saying that. Right. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying once the KHL season is over, then we may possibly know at some point if he's going to come over here for the next season or not. And that's it. We may possibly know sometime uh, you know, later this spring if that's going to happen. But that's it. And, and otherwise, I mean, you know, we've got a month and a half of bup kiss. I mean, really nothing to really look forward to. You hope that Jerry Mayhew has a good showing. Um, <clears throat> you'd love to get something, you know, have something in him like, like we've, a lot of people think you may have with all the scoring he's done in the A. And, and, and you hope Kevin Fiala continues on this tear, and you just hope that nobody gets hurt. And that's it. I mean, you, you hope Dumba improves. There's a couple of reasons to watch kind of tied to the future. But otherwise, you have no reason to have a vested interest in this team. Best case scenario for me is, at least in the problem of goaltending, is the Wild just complete nosedive now, which will not happen. <laughs> and they... They get out of the race early enough to where they can give Capo Kakin an extended look and goal, but we're not going to get that. And this this is kind of a, an underlying problem for me is that the Wild aren't out of it enough to where they can give Kakin a look and they have to keep going back to the well of Staylock and Dubnik. Right. So they'll just give Kakin like a pity last two starts of the year or whatever when they're officially out of it. Yeah. And, again, wild goaltending is bad, and you need to find a permanent fix to that moving forward. And I, I think Capo Kakin has done well enough in Iowa where he deserves a, a look, but, you know, if you're not going to give him that look, then, then what's the point? I, I mean, if the New York Hockey Rangers are proud enough to... Uh, healthy scratch Henrik Lundqvist mm -hmm. so they can see what their two goalie prospects, Gorgiev and uh, Shesterkin, I think yeah, is how you say it, right. a look, then that should be sending a message to teams like the Wild that no goalie is truly untouchable, but they just are so up their rear end in delusion about mm. – making the playoffs and having two home playoff dates where they just get obliterated that they just sacrifice their their future, which is clearly where they need to go at this point, and they don't. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe you st we started to maybe think that with Bill Guerin and the Zucker trade, but not moving anything else before the deadline says – all right, so you just sent Zucker away, who was put on the fourth line anyway. So you're not really losing anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. It, at least, I guess, at least he made that deal. If you're going to be quote unquote rebuilding or, or reloading or whatever the the terminology you want to use is, at least he made that deal where you're getting some futures that you desperately need. You're getting some money off the books, uh, which you kind of need at this point too. Um, I don't know. It just it, it's it's really hard to argue for a lot of positivity with this team. The exception of you do have Krill Cappers off waiting in the wings, and if you want to keep a decent, not good, but not terrible team, a decent team, kind of a very very middle team like this is at its best together, and see what Krill Cappers off adds to it next season. I kind of sort of get that argument because one player can do a lot for a team and you still have to address the goaltending. Don't get me wrong on that at all, but you add cappers off, you add a new goalie. Maybe you've got a good enough team to make the playoffs next year without giving away anything, you know, at the deadline except for Zucker a couple weeks ago. But um, that's the only thing that I see here. And, and that's the only, that's the only positivity that I can draw from this as well. At least you've got Kepers off coming. You can maybe find some goaltending. It's going to be hard, and there's no guarantee on that. But if you can, you know, if you get those two things, 
again, you've got a team that maybe can get two home playoff games next year and <laughs> not really do much beyond that, but who what? knows? <laughs> okay, but say you somehow patch up your goal and you have Capra's off. You're still horribly weak down the middle. Somebody has to feed him the puck. The Wild don't seem to want to give Jule Eriksson a look at top center for whatever reason. For Christ's sakes, Sunday night against the Blues, Miko Koivu got put up at one center over Eriksson Ek. Should he be scratched? What? what? <laughs> <sighs> Time is a bloody flat circle, <laughs> and this was the other kind of news newsy thing out of the weekend was Miko Koivu. Would, uh, told Bill Guerin he wanted to stay for the remainder of the season in Minnesota, so thus he would not waive his uh, his no trade or no move. Right. Uh, so he will play out the remaining however many games there are with the Wild, and it sounds like he's leaning on retirement uh, yeah. after the season, uh, which y- you kind of expect as you've seen a pretty sharp decline in his his play, but what are you going to do at center? You're going to have the spot open, vacated by Koivu. Uh, they're going to give maybe Galchenyuk a look at center, but... I'm not very confident. It, Yeah, he, he never really worked out for him before, and yeah. Galchenyuk isn't even signed past this year, so yeah. there's another guy off the roster. Uh, maybe they don't see Eriksson Ek as a one center, but it's hard to not see anything when you don't give said player chance and then you have Eric Stahl so there's going to be two spots at center open for the wild Mm -hmm. I would like them to give one of those spots to Alex Kovanoff next year who's second in points in the Quebec major junior league behind potential number one overall pick uh, Alex Lafreniere Mm -hmm. I just that's the plan. Win the lottery. Obviously. I mean, that that's that's the plan, that's right? That's a great strategy, <laughs> Cotton. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go as far as to say that I need to see Eric Sinek as, uh, on the first line. As long as he's getting good minutes, which Dean Everson has been giving him a little bit more minutes than he was getting under Bruce. Not by, a, you know, this isn't earth-shattering difference, but he is getting a little bit of a bump. So that's good, um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, who's going to play center for him? And, and again, they will have some cap space, but that doesn't always necessarily mean a good thing either because no. cap space is like, you know, the devil's workshop with GMs sometimes where just invites them to make bloody deals that they're going to regret, like, I don't know, Andrew Ladd. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know. It, I, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't know that there, there even is a plan necessarily. I think it's... I think, honestly, the plan is just to wait to see what Kaepernick does for the team. And uh, we'll wait to see if maybe Kovanov is something that, that can help. And and he's certainly playing well enough right now to where it's like, you know, you could see him possibly being productive in the NHL. Maybe not right off the bat, but it's not outlandish to think that. So this is the list of free agent centers <laughs> upcoming, in case you're wondering. Oh, God. Uh, for the the next... Uh, summer, July uh, 2020. Uh-huh. Uh, trying to filter out the stupid RFAs because I don't need to see those. Um, all right, I guess I'll just try to read here. The number one center on the market in terms of points is old friend Tyler Ennis <laughs> with 33 <laughs> as a UFA. <laughs> Next on the list is Carl oh. Soderberg with 31 points. Awesome. And then uh, Derek Broussard, 29 points. Okay. Uh, so there is uh, not much at center this offseason. So you really have to wonder what's going to happen, and you have to wonder if Garen is going to majorly revisit trading a defenseman like Brodine or Dumba for a number one center because he's not going to find an answer 
on the free agent market. And I don't envision him offer sheeting somebody because <laughs> nobody does that. And when they do, it's just a softball pitch by the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah, the uh, so actually, the uh, if you sort by current cap hit, the top center that's going to be UFA next summer is Miko Koivu. <laughs> Uh, yeah. by, followed by Soderberg, followed by Martin Hansel, followed by uh, Sam Gagne, Colin Wilson, Joe Thornton. Not, yeah, not so much. Not so much on this list. You know who is a free agent at center? Is it number 56? Yes. Oh, nice. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah. I, I digress. I, yeah. True. I hope Fair. he goes back to Vegas so I can get a 56 Vegas jersey. I would I, agree. I screwed up. I would, well, yeah, kind of. Although it was pointed out to me today, I can get a signed Vegas jersey on NHL shop for seventy-five dollars by fifty-six today. So I think you should do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I need I need money for that. Um. <laughs> all right. Uh, so trade deadline is is now done. The Wild are set for the remainder of the season. Any final thoughts on that before we we move along? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't have anything. Um, I don't know. I I, I certainly understand Garen's sentiment of I you know I don't want to make a deal for the sake of making a deal. I think that's smart, but on the flip side of that, I I just I don't know. I feel like there could have been something done. It was such a seller's market. I mean, JP Pajot gets a first and a second. I mean, in a you know conditional third, that's not really a big deal. But uh, a first and a second, a first and a second, and and, and it's just like I, you know, I don't know. It, um, obviously, we you know, we're not in the room, so we can't really talk a whole lot of s. But it just we're not uh, right. No, we're not, even, we're not even allowed in the arena, Giles. Let alone yeah. the room. Fact. All right. Uh, let's move it along. So the other big news uh, in the last week uh, outside of, you know, roster moves or lack thereof was that the Winter Classic opponent uh, was (laughs) revealed on Sunday evening during the intermission of the Blues game. And it was the St. Louis Blues. Go figure. During the Blues game. Yay. Shocking. Yay. Um, and we shared our thoughts on Twitter, and we got into <laughs> arguments <laughs> with uh, those in the uh, great state of Kansas. Oh, I'm sorry, Missouri. <laughs> I get it. Uh, and it, it, I think to convey our point, so what we were trying to say was, from a Minnesota Wild opponent perspective – the Blues are least, really least interesting in terms of the pizzazz. I don't want to say least, but they are definitely They're not, not top up 10. there. Yeah. They're definitely not top 10. And this isn't to say that we think the Blues are not an interesting hockey team to watch. Sure. But that's how our comments were construed. Well, I think, I mean, yeah, that's kind of what we said because... That's kind of what we well, mean. That wasn't what I was necessarily going for. I think it's just that Wild fans didn't really want to see the Blues because even though they're a divisional opponent, even though they're defending Stanley Cup champions, there's not really a whole lot there that's super exciting. Um, you know, Valimir Tarasenko is a fun player to watch. That's true. But what else about the Blues is fun to watch exactly? I mean, Jordan Bennington has had a great playoff run, and, and their playoff run last year, that was exciting, right? Like, not I'm not arguing that, but everything else about the team, it's like, I just, I don't know. They're Wild not fans really enjoy watching Jake Allen ride the bench after stonewalling their I, best chance yeah. to go far in the playoffs. It's because he's ass. Um, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I I don't understand why Blues fans got so butthurt, other than the fact that they're Blues fans and they're just butthurt because you said something negative about the team. Imagine if somebody said this about the Wild. Be like, oh, we got the Wild? Well, that's boring. would be like, yeah, yeah I, I feel you. Yeah, I mean, that that's sucks. What I, but, uh, I ended up doing a little mini thread with it because I tried to clarify my thoughts, but nobody cared. 
So I <laughs> muted. I had to mute it after a while because I got tired. Yeah, so I, I didn't because I, I like to fight. But well, yeah, I just wasn't in the mood. So, <laughs> I, I the uh, the Avs or the Jets have better, you know, pizzazz for the Wild in the Winter Classic because the yeah. Avs are probably right up there as their biggest rival, as well as the Jets, who offer a a local, a more closer opponent. Yeah. And uh, imagine the atmosphere at Target Field between the Wild and the Jets with crazy Manitobans making the <laughs> trek on down for the the January 1 game. I, I could be in the minority on this. I know a lot of people wanted the Jets. I it, That was never, ever, 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 ever in a million years going to happen. Right. They're Canadian, number one, and it's a small Canadian market, number two. There's just not... I mean, and, and I totally agree. I totally... That would have been probably, if you had to rank the most fun games to be at, Wild and Jets was probably number one, and I agree with that. That was... But they were never going to be the opponent, ever, ever. And the Avs just had a stadium series game a week ago, so... I understand why those team two teams weren't picked, but I don't know. I, I still and, and obviously nobody wants to see Chicago in another outdoor game for the love of effing God. But <clears throat> I don't know. It just seems like the Wild Blues isn't that interesting because we see them play all the time. It's not like they have particularly amazing games. It's not like their their matchup is particularly uh, filled with intrigue and drama. Like it's just not something that we look forward to it's not anything that you circle on a calendar so having one of their five or six matchups next season be outdoors is just kind of like well i mean at least it's the winter classic i guess watch this game is just like two to one or some <laughs> crap it just perfectly putting the exclamation point on the wild getting the winter classic yeah <laughs> If there are any Blues fans who are actually listening, I'm just as equally shocked that the Wild did get a Winter Classic because their trajectory is of a downward trajectory, and they typically like to give that to teams on the up and up or up at the upper echelon yeah. uh, of the league. So huh. I, I still can't believe this is happening. So whatever, I, you know. And then there was just a little part of me that hoped like. The Golden Knights oh, would, would so sneak great. in. You know, it, so those great. games are always typically good anyway between the Wild yeah. and the Golden Knights. And Absolutely. what a way to feature your new team that's really put themselves on a map. I, I, I don't know. Just a, just a blah matchup for the Winter Classic. And very. I don't know. We'll just get that as you you said that good. Uh, Russian on Russian uh, commentary uh, <laughs> after the election, so nobody will be, of course, sick of that. <clears throat> oh, it'll be fun and a drunk Brett Hall. Let's 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 have a party. Uh, but I mean, you know, are you think we're going to see what kind of jerseys do you think we're going to see out of this? Do you think the Wild are going to do something new and exciting, or are they going to have green jerseys with something re- relating to the state of hockey on it? I don't know. It's a winter classic, so they'll probably try to do something that's more of a throwback variety, but... Ooh, bring back the red jerseys. Well, the Wild don't necessarily have a deep history to go throwback, <laughs> so right. maybe they'll do like one of those faux throwbacks. Oh, for sure. That they'll they'll try to attempt and have the Blues and that's what they all wing out now. something else from their history. If the Blues wore their jerseys from the 90s, I will be very happy. No, they won't. They won't, though. Someone's. No, you're right. They won't. Uh, I, I don't really have any more to say on this because it's just it's boring to me. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sorry if that upsets some of you. It just... It, it my my shock was the a wild fan that chirped me for calling it boring. I don't know. That was... <laughs> I was like, what? Dude, are we, are we talking about the same thing? Yeah, we're not here to blow smoke up the team's rear end. No. That's that's not our game. No, and I'm, I'm not hating on the Blues. They're a good team. I mean, obviously, we just saw that on Sunday night. They're a good team. But yeah. I just didn't really care to see them in a Winter Classic, and I don't think that that's that outlandish of a statement to make. It was really nice of them to have uh, Joe Maurer reveal the, the opponent 
Oh, that's that that's was sure nice. Look, it's the blues. You <laughs> betcha. <laughs> you know that was kind of a cool way to do it. It, it tied in really well. You had Mar Morneau, you know, two. I mean, Morneau is at least a very tried and true hockey fan. Uh, Maurer's a hometown boy. Spring training just started. They're playing catch at Target Field. I, I liked that a lot. Um, but it also lends itself to a lot of boring jokes, uh, along with the actual selection of the St. Louis Blues itself. So, <laughs> which I promptly made uh, on Twitter because I'm hacky like that. So. Uh yeah, I mean it, it was nice though. I thought it was nice. Did you? Did you? Oh yeah, it was oh, nice. Okay, I was gonna. You sounded kind of. Like, you sounded kind of like you were, weren't feeling it. No, I'm just trying to mimic a boring Joe. Oh Howard sure, sure. Kind of thing. Fair. He probably was tired from the the shoot, so afterwards he had to go <laughs> have a glass of milk. Yeah. Oh, of course. He just chugged the milk after that. We should have brought in a baseball expert to to talk about this. <laughs> We are baseball experts. What are you talking about? Yeah, that that is true. Uh-huh. Uh, I, and I, I guessing there'll be more details revealed as we we go on. But it, I don't think really anything happens until like no, next year. Not really. They don't do anything in the summer with it. Uh-huh. So I, I guess that's all we're gonna get for a while. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I will try to dig for some Jersey info, but <laughs> you know. I don't know, whatever. I don't have the connections. Yeah. I need those. <laughs> you need to hire us as consultants, Hardy. We'll send some concepts to Adidas. Ah, that's a good idea. Yep. I'm just going to spam their Twitter In inbox. case you were worried if our Jersey segment was gone forever. <laughs> we find a way to revive it as often as possible, damn it. <laughs> it's just that, uh, that WWE meme where the dude just rises up. Oh, and the Undertaker, down. yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly it. That's our Jersey segment. I'm I'm glad you figured out what I was talking about because I don't know. Oh, any come other on. Names. No. I mean, that's that's simple stuff for me. Oh. All right. Uh, so, remaining NHL trade deadline thoughts. Did you have any, you know, big, big winners or losers or anything that really jumped off the page at you today? No, not really. I mean, you you covered it. Uh, I liked what the Caps and and Vegas did as well. Um, I thought that those were good moves. The Canes um, added Vinny yeah. Trocheck, uh, uh, Brady Shea. They were all over the place, right? Um, so I, I mean, I I don't know. It it it's honestly seems like the the Senators did well for themselves, which is. They've got some like hard fourteen to draft off. picks <laughs> yeah, coming got, in twenty twenty. I think they said they have twenty nine draft picks in the next three drafts, or, or something even more than that, something obscene like that. So just have the senators draft table on the stage for the first two rounds, <laughs> <laughs> which those players are cheap. So Melnick has to love that. Um, yeah, all those entry level deals right, coming in twenty twenty three. They're basically starting an ex- expansion franchise. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, I think if you have to pick three, or that would be four teams that, you know, four winners, yeah. You know, losers, I don't know. I mean, it seemed like the Isles paid an awful lot for J.P. Bajo, kind of in reverse of the uh, Ottawa deal. Um, you know, locally, obviously, we're disappointed in the Wild not doing anything, Um but I don't, I, yeah, and that's probably going to be a sentiment shared on the national stage. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, I think the Wild really made themselves kind of a lightning rod for attention with the Parisi deal that fell apart. And sure. Then yeah. Not doing anything else when you had some premium assets out there that didn't get moved. Uh, they're probably going to be seen as a, a negative from this trade deadline. Mm. It also, as a fan, it was a little bit disappointing not to see Joe Thornton move to a contender. Yeah, uh, that, that was, was something that was that being was kicked sad. around quite a bit, and the Sharks are obviously a dumpster fire. Um, so, I, I mean, there was a little bit of talk of him going back to Boston, which would have been really cool, um, or anywhere. I mean, if he would have gone to a team and, and won a ring, I mean, what what an awesome, awesome story. And uh, that would have been a lot of fun to root for just because, you know, Jumbo Joe's a, a pretty easy guy to root for, I feel like. Um, so that, that, was, that was a big loser on the day, too. Boston isn't going to win the Cup this year going to be another Vegas Caps Stanley Cup final. <laughs> Is that according to your betting lines or Uh no, just no, I'm just kidding. I don't <laughs> no comment. I, I don't know. Like Tampa Bay's really making a charge, but 
you know, we'll see what happens with them. And obviously Boston is right there. So he can't discount them. Sure. That's a, that's a good team. Yeah. So I, you know, and there was a lot of movement before the deadline too, which you, True. Know, you, you typically see now. And so, um, yeah, it, it was a little more active than what I thought it was going to be uh, on trade yeah, deadline day. True. Uh, a lot of deals, especially a lot of after the deadline deals that uh, trickled through. So, Giles and uh, the goalie had a deal. We acquired a 1995 uh, McDonald's slash Batman Forever Ford Thunderbat model, as modeled on our Twitter account at GATG Wild Podcast. We're very excited about this new mascot that we acquired today. Um, painstakingly built by myself over the course of the last uh, six weeks-ish, month-ish. Um, and I really don't feel like the Batman Forever joke can die for us. It just, it uh, it keeps being applicable no matter how hard we try. Uh, the wild just keep on kind of feeding into the whole uh, time is a flat circle slash Batman Forever mold that we have yeah your office is really filling up with the batman forever stuff <laughs> well you're the one that put up this poster so right yeah <laughs> i can keep going <laughs> fair i can find you some movie posters i'm good I can find you all kinds of things no it's okay One's maybe enough. and find a script wow that'd be impressive but um yeah i it's it's often hard to say like trade deadline winners and losers, especially when you get those deals where there's draft picks and sure. prospects involved, because yeah. it it takes a lot of time for you to see the results of that and fully judge a, a, a trade. So, mm -hmm. and, but just on the the initial uh, reaction today, I liked what. Um, Washington and Vegas did, and honestly, Vegas is just becoming a a heavy a heavy favorite for me out of the West, especially with the addition of Robin Lehner, because goaltending has really been a problem for them this year. And yeah, that's yeah, that's why Gerard Gallant got fired because they got terrible goaltending. <laughs> so, did you see on TSN he was on the? One of their panels, and yes. he he put the Knights as yeah, top, top five, five yeah. cup favorites. Well, you know, honestly, you got to feel for him though. I mean, yeah. what, he, those are his guys, you know, and and he knows how good that team can be. He's been there, so I I really uh, yeah I, I totally feel for the guy in that instance. I unfortunately didn't get to see any of Bruce today. I was stuck at work, and um, NHL Network doesn't really have a very obvious platform to you to watch on your computer no. for some reason. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't get to see any of Bruce, but I hope that uh, he yeah, he did as well. That was kind of the regret of hoped. not really being able to get the Sportsnet feed was the the lack of seeing Bruce. So I mm -hmm. sounds like he had a few a uh, few good lines in there, but uh, of course, you know, I was I have ESPN Plus, so I was watching the uh, the TSN feed, which I usually do end up watching anyway because I kind of prefer their uh, their coverage. Okay, but. You know, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that can probably do it for this show. We've kind of gone over everything we we need to, and we can kind of let our thoughts saturate for a week and then come back and see what else we can uh, vent about next week. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm curious to see what happens now with the Wild out of this post-trade deadline uh, with the very public... Uh, near trade of Zach Parisi, yeah, uh, who was undoubtedly a uh, very primary figure in the Minnesota Wild locker room. Uh, so, keeping uh, keeping up with how they're going to do moving forward will be my interest because they're either I either feel like they're going to play ridiculously, or at least Parisi is, or they're mm. just going to nosedive. I feel like there's not going to be an in between. That's fair. Do you do you think they sign a new coach during the season or no? No, they wait till the off season. They'll probably they wait. Okay, that's fair. I I, I would I tend to agree. So, I mean, good for Dean Evason for apparently giving Jerry Mayhew a, a look in mm -hmm. the top six role. That'd I'm be anxious to see that. We'll see how that goes and how that lasts. Yeah. So we'll 
we'll see. It'll probably be one of our things to talk about next week. Um, but uh, for now, we'll just leave you with the feeling of you're probably disappointed after the lack of trades on uh, <laughs> Monday. So we'll just uh, leave you feeling that because that's how we always leave our listeners disappointed <laughs> and wanting more. So we're going to stay on brand here. The tradition continues. Uh, follow Ben and I on Twitter at... Ben Remington at Giles Farrell. Our podcast is on Twitter at GATG Wild Podcast. Uh, the podcast is available on SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, uh, and of course iTunes. And if you do listen via iTunes, uh, please subscribe and uh, leave us a rating. It helps us immensely. Uh, you can check this podcast out also at zonecoverage.com slash wild. That is also where my written content goes. So if I say on the show I mentioned this, that probably means I wrote that somewhere. So that is where you can go to find where I've said that previously. Uh, so that will wrap it up for us this week, and we will talk to you again next week. Later. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Gill and the Goaltender podcast. That's not resiliency. You're making it sound like we're good. That's all. I'm done. <laughs>